when the Germans invaded Holland, they bombed all the radio stations out of existence. The people were living on tulip bulbs. We could go to the black market. This is the nose of the airplane where my seat was. A pound of butter was $300. One plane after the other goes into a steep dive. An egg was $12. And the noise of the airplane when you dive is tremendous. A large bag of potatoes was $900. Boom, boom, boom. Money really didn't have any value anymore. See them blow apart and go down. We practically were hoping every day that we would come out of it alive. This is Ed Seppels and I was stationed during World War II at Snetherton Heath in England in the 96 Bomb Squadron. I'm Ted Veiling. I was born in Amsterdam, Holland in 1930. The uh, German people had overrun Holland and had captured them and had eaten up most of the food. We had no electricity, we had no heat, so uh, we had formed a group of kids. We were 12 and 13 years old when we started vowing that we were going to keep our block alive. This is our squadron's emblem. It's called the bomb in the barrel. We wore it on the back of our flight jackets. A pilot was Sam Cotton, Ole Olson, navigator. This is a picture of Hanrahan. He was our engineer. This is Hanrahan and Masters. Hanrahan was a New York City policeman before he got in the Army. This is the nose of the airplane where my seat was. Masters was the radio operator. Dexter was the tail gunner. The guy from the, from the south was, I can't think of his name. I like him too. How old is everybody? We were, we were all, uh, you know, 19, 20. We stole guns, we stole food. We would see the barges with the supplies for the Germans, get some straw and paper, set the barge with the ammunition on fire. And as the German guards would race to put the fire out, you'd have bullets flying everywhere. We would sneak into the barge with the food and then carry as much as we could out of there and bring it home. We practically were hoping every day that we would come out of it alive. The noise level is very high in a B-17, you know, and if the guns start firing, you add that, that's 12, 12 uh, guns firing at one time, you know. The anti-aircraft guns are all in the target area, you know, firing away, boom, boom, boom. And the flak exploded. It broke up into small parts and it would land on the planes and you'd hear it like rain on the roof, you know, rain on a tin roof. You know, that noise, 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 noise. If a big piece hit you, you know, it tore, ripped the plane apart, you could, you know, you could see them blow apart and go down. And you know what it looks like? It looks like uh, fireworks on the 4th of July when they're all bursting up in front of you. It's not pretty. It's a dirty gray color, but it's, it's very noticeable. And you can see it and you know you're going to go right through it. 
when the oil heat was shut off, we went to coal. When we could no longer get coal, we had to go to wood. Um, when the wood ran out, um, we started cutting firewood in a forest outside the city that the Germans used for their natural camouflage for their ammunition dump. We had three cutters and two stackers and two kids with submachine guns in the trees so that if a German patrol came on us, we shot first. So I killed my first uh, German guards when I was 13. I could never talk to my dad and mom about what I was doing during the day, about the stealing, the, the killing, because the only place we would sit was with the one light bulb in the living room. My sister was five years younger and my little brother was another four years younger. Uh, you never knew what they might say to a little friend. And Mom's saying always was, kleine potjes have a grote oren, little pots have big ears. So, you know, it was a horribly lonely time because you really couldn't talk to anyone. The only one I had was the priest. As soon as curfew lifted at seven o'clock, we would go to the church and each team would do a minimum of 10 funerals every single morning. People had starved to death and you could look around and you knew who you were going to be burying next week. How did you know? They were so weak and emaciated. I was a considered to be quite well off and quite healthy, but my weight at that time, I was close to six foot, and I weighed somewhere between 60 and 65 pounds. They were eating tool bulbs, that's how hungry they were. That was, that was their main, main thing. Our bread for our rations. It was 20% flour and 80% ground tulip bulbs. And that made a really black, soggy mass. You couldn't really dry it out. It tasted horrible, but it was food. bombs were held in the sides of the plane with shackles and the shackles released you know on the radio signal well they froze you know it's 30 below zero at 30,000 feet and the pilot said okay Sevels go back there and kick them out <laughs> so the, the catwalk in the bomb bay is eight inches wide and the uh, bomb bay doors were opened in order to go in there and kick them out, you had to walk across that with nothing to hold on to until you got to the middle. Then the, you could hang on to the frame there and, and kick them, you know, and you tried to kick the top ones. The bottom of the doors are open 30,000 feet. You're freezing, you got an oxygen mask on, you got to carry an oxygen tank with you. So well, that was kind of hazardous duty, I guess. But.
we were going to bring the food in on B-17s. They had put a uh, plywood in the bomb squat in the bomb bay, canned goods, canned bacon, everything that they could find, both the British government and the Americans. There was a big concern because the Germans were too sure that we could see their men were in the, in the gun turrets, you know. They were watching. If they thought we were going to drop a bomb, they were going to start shooting. But we wouldn't drop a bomb that close to the ground because it would blow us up, you know. I was in the nose of the airplane. We didn't have a bombardier. I rode in his seat. We were going along <clears throat> the canals in Holland that you see everywhere there. And the greenhouses where they grow the tulip bulbs. When you see all those airplanes coming down the street at 500 feet that you've never seen before, you know, they knew something was going on. We could see the planes in front of us dropping, you know. We didn't all drop at once. We dropped as we got farther and farther along. It dropped right bang, you know, and it, it spread out in, in all directions. We saw these people riding bicycles along the edge of the canal. And some of the rations fell into the canal. And we saw a guy he, he dropped his bike right where he was and dove into the canal and he grabbed that package. He was a happy man. Dear Mr. Seppels, I want to congratulate you on Edward's fine work and honors. I was particularly interested in his work over Holland as friends of ours live under a church steeple at The Hague. So this lady who was a wealthy lady in Litchfield sent this letter to my father congratulating his, him on his son's good work and doing, stopping the killing and doing something good, dropping food for the people in Holland. And they would like to know that one of the planes bringing the desperately needed food was dropped on them by a boy from Litchfield. Sincerely yours, Catherine von der Muehl. The first thing I had to decide is what to do about the hate. I had learned to hate pretty well. I had also seen what hate did to the Nazis. It destroyed them as human beings also. So I decided that I did not want to hate and I would forgive for what they had done to our family. I had learned from working with the other kids that even as kids, working together and sharing, we could do a hell of a lot. And I figured that was the kind of life I really wanted to lead. And that's the kind of life I have been leading. I think we were proud of the fact that we served the country. We just served, you know, and we, didn't ask for any pension or anything. Or we used to sing a song, uh, when the war is over, we will all enlist again. Like hell we will, like hell. <laughs> and this gentleman got up and he said, uh, I'm not a veteran of your country, I'm a veteran of Holland. And he said, but everybody in Holland wants to thank the American people for, and the American Air Force for bringing in this food for us because we were really starving. He was a nice guy. 